Good morning, Pine Valley Community Church. Would you guys stand? We're going to praise our God, lift up some songs of worship to him. Father God, we just, we want to come here. We want to bless your name, Lord. We want to give you honor, give you glory. Lord, fill this place with yourself, Lord. Help our minds during this time to be fixed on you, Lord. Undivided and fully attentive to your spirit, Lord. In your name, amen.
great are you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Volunteers. 
We have an open slot, which is the fourth week of every month. The church needs to be clean. We've got most of those uh, other weeks handled, but we could use some other folks. So if, in fact, you might have time that fourth week, contact Darlene Holiday. She'll fill you in on the details. It would have been a perfect day to do that, too, because Mary was up here. She'd wrap me out. She'd wrap me out just like that. She's not here today. I'm still brooding over that. So um, also PBCC shirts are available, 15 bucks a pop. You can go ahead and look up here and get your uh, get the details on that. And finally, Mayor Aragon, she's going to show us a video on uh, the upcoming Operation Christmas Child. And after the video, she's going to come up and say a few things about it. Mary, you want to, or actually, we'll show the video first. The very first need of this community is liberation from fear. They've been worshiping water deities. We need a way of explaining Jesus liberates from fear. We've actually evangelized areas for months, but with the shoebox, we didn't know it was going to be so easy. We saw that if we are to do something in this area, then we have to start with the kids. We brought the shoe boxes across the river for the children. One, two, three, open, let me win. Oh, <laughs> Kekens <laughs> We started this Bible study with the kids, and that has continued until it became a church. New things are happening every day in this church that there is improvement in every area of their lives, especially the kids. Every Sunday they bring in more kids and that is fantastic.
So start preparing. We're going to have a packing party just like always. You're going to hear all kinds of really great um, impact stories of how the gospel has changed people's lives. And I want you to pray about how you can be involved in this ministry. So we're going to send good news and give great joy, right? right. Woo! Amen. All right. Kids can head out to class. We can all meet here. Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Wasn't that amazing worship this morning? That was so good. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you this morning for the opportunity to share your word. I ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Speak to every heart here this morning, Lord. We just thank you for the worship team. We thank you for the sound team, Lord, all the work they put in. We thank you for our youth and for Pastor Jeff on, on the uh, youth mission, Lord. Pray you're watching over them throughout the river trip, Lord. We pray for our elders. Just lift them up to you. Pray you'll give them wisdom, Lord. And Father, we pray for the shepherd that you will call for our church, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you're even preparing his heart, even right now. And we ask all this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to pick it up in James this morning, and we're going to talk about overcoming anger. We're going to talk about anger this morning. And yes, I got, I got to tell you, I used to have a really bad temper. I had a really bad temper when I was young. And I remember, I was thinking about that this week when I was, when I was reading what James had to say. And so I got my first car when I was 17 and it was my grandfather's car. And it was one of those deals, it was 10 years old when I got it, but it was brand new to me. Uh, it was a 1967 VW Bug. I was so happy to have it, you know. And uh, truly, there were only 800 miles on it. They just used it to drive from the store and back. But one day, I put a vacuum, a shop vac, in the back of it, because my friend wanted to borrow it. And so I was driving over to their house. And as I took a corner, the shop vac went on wheels, rolled over, and hit the other side. And I got so mad, I don't know what made me so mad, I punched the, my windshield, brand new car for me, and it cracked it. Those VWs had really thin windshields. Put a little crack in that thing. I had to go home and explain to my dad why there was a crack in my windshield that obviously came from the inside, not the outside. And I realized at that point in my life, I needed to get a hold of my anger. I was only 17, but I realized this is not a good thing. Later in, the lot, in my life, I, I gave my heart to Jesus, and I asked the Holy Spirit to help me with that. And I would say at this point, to be honest with you, it's pretty rare for me to get mad. I'm not an angry guy anymore. The Holy Spirit did a work in my heart. Well, today, James is going to talk to us about anger and some other things. So we're, we're going to pick it up in verse 19. James says, understand this. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all filth and evil in your lives, and humbly accept the word God planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. So Christians, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. James gives us a couple of little things to work on there that's going to help with this. He says that we should be quick to hear, quick to listen. If you translated that literally, it would be quick to the hearing. Be quick to the hearing. Quick to listen. Well, listen, if you want to minister to your Christian brothers and sisters, and if you want to evangelize, you need to be quick to hear. Even conflict res resolution, when you're trying to resolve a conflict, I find that most of the time, 
If I'm just willing to listen to the person that I think I'm in conflict with, we're not that far off. But you have to be quick to hear. You have to listen and be willing to hear what they have to say. See, a lot of us men think that we're problem solvers. And sometimes we are. Sometimes we can be really good problem solvers. And yet, if you don't listen, how can you solve a problem? And men, I want to tell you something. And I don't give out marital advice very often because I know as soon as I give it out, I'm going to go home and get in a fight. <laughs> but I want to tell you this. If you want your wife to love you, listen to her. Listen to her. It only took me 35 years of marriage to just start to understand this a little bit. All the years my wife would tell me she had the problem, I'd try to fix it for her right away. I'm, I've got the solution to fix this for you. And it took the longest time for that to sink in, for me to realize she just wants me to listen to her. She just wants to be heard. If you want your wife to fall in love with you, listen to what she has to say. See, you can't minister to anyone unless you listen to what they have to say. I believe it's the key to evangelism. Now listen, I don't want us to go into the connection room and for it to be dead silent this morning. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying there's, there's a time to listen. There's a time for us to listen to one another. My uncle used to tell me, my uncle was a preacher, and he used to tell me, God gave you two ears and one mouth, therefore you should listen twice as much as you talk. That's pretty good advice. I love that kind of old sound advice like that. But if you remember when we were talking in verse 18 last week, it talked about God's word, having God's word in our heart. We're going to see it again in verse 22, having God's word in our heart. A lot of times, like I said, we think James is jumping topics. I think one of the things he's telling us here is we should be quick to listen to God. As Christians, we should be quick to listen to God, what God has to say to us. But he gives us two things to work on. Things that will help us to manage our anger. He says we should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and then slow to get angry. And I think the best way to be slow to get angry is to let the Holy Spirit control your heart. If the Holy Spirit's in control of your heart, you're going to be slow to get angry. Be disciplined, be quick to hear, be slow to speak. For he tells us that human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Human anger, that deep resentment that we get, does not produce the righteousness that God desires. See, our goal is to be a representative of God's on earth. Anger doesn't help with that. Let me tell you something. That's one of the quickest ways to ruin your witness to someone. They see you get angry. Why would I want what that guy has in his life? He's, he's walking around mad all the time. Anger has the opposite effect. And listen, I've heard a lot of excuses. I've heard people tell me before, well, after all, didn't Jesus clear the temple? He got in there, he made a whip, and he, he cleared the temple out. But I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what is the difference between us and Jesus. Remember what we talked about? There's no darkness in Jesus. He doesn't have a sin nature. So when Jesus got mad, it was righteous indignation. You and I don't have that. I want to tell you, even when I see sin happening and I get mad at sin, a little bit of my flesh gets involved in that. Because I have a sin nature. Jesus didn't have a sin nature. So don't use that as an excuse to get angry. You know what else people have told me about getting angry before? Well, you know, I'm Irish. So uh, we Irishmen get angry. We Germans get angry. We Hispanics, we get angry sometimes. As though our ethnicity gives us an excuse. We'd really be better off saying, it's my sin nature, that's what's making me angry here. Let's just be honest about it before God. 
My mom used to say that to me when I was a little kid and I'd lose my temper. Oh, there's the German coming out in you. <laughs> no, it was my sin nature. And James tells us that human anger will not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all filthiness and evil in your lives. He says get rid of it. He says put it away. The idea behind this is, it is like at the end of the day when you come home and you've been working all day and you take those dirty clothes off. Get rid of it. Shed it. Get rid of it. It's got no place in your life. Remember last week we talked about when sin comes into your life, get rid of it. Quickly. Repent. Turn from it. It's not going to do you any good. He said to get rid of all filth and evil that's in your life. You know, I, sometimes I think this starts with small things. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, and I know this probably isn't a popular stance to take, but I've got a, I've got a friend that asked me to take him to the store once in a while. He can't drive, so... I drove over to his neighborhood this week to take him to the store. And you know, every house in that neighborhood, there was skeletons, and there were ghosts, and there were witches, and there was all this celebrating going on. And it was, it actually was creepy. It was daytime, and I was like, wow, this is a creepy neighborhood. <laughs> and it was. I want to tell you, in John chapter 14, Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world, the prince of this world. I'm not going to honor him in my front yard, I'll just tell you. And I'll give you my address. If you want to come to my house to trick or treat, I'm going to have a nice track to give you. <laughs> That's just how it is. I'm not, going, I'm not going to give the devil any glory. It's his world, and he's the ruler of it, but it's temporary. It's temporary. He's in charge, but not for long. He, James tells us to get rid of all filthiness, all evil. That word filthiness literally could be translated pollution. Get rid of all pollution, all evil, all wickedness that's in your life. See, we're in a battle. We're in a battle every day. We truly are in a spiritual battle. And one thing I'll say I've noticed over the years in my walk, my Christian walk, I regret every inch of territory I've ever given up to the devil. I regret it. I always look back at anything I've ever given him, and I gave in, and I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do this, and I want this to happen or that to happen. So I've always regretted it. I love watching old documentaries, the Second World War and General Patton, because General Patton hated to give up territory. If he won territory, he, he said men died and, and gave their lives for that territory. We're not giving it back. We're not retreating. We're not going to retreat. I, mean, I love that. James tells us to humbly accept the word of God that's planted in our hearts. See, we get rid of all the worldly things that are in our lives. We humbly and meekly accept God's word that's planted in our heart. Men, you wouldn't have a healthy relationship with your wife if you didn't listen to her. Marcus, Marcus the mic on? I didn't get a single amen on that. I'll say it again. <laughs> Men, you wouldn't have a healthy relationship with your wife if you didn't sometimes listen to her. Amen. Amen. Sometimes. 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 <laughs> you need to hear her sometimes. Matthew chapter 13. Do you remember this when Jesus talked? He told the story about the farmer spreading the seed. It's like the word of God going out. And he said some of the seeds fell on the footpath and the birds ate it up. Some of the seeds fell on the shallow soil and when the sun hit it, it burned up. Some of the seeds fell among thorns and it got choked out. 
And then some of the seeds fell on fertile soil, and it grew, and a great harvest came. When you open up God's word, is your heart fertile soil? Are you listening to what God has to say, carefully looking at his word? Charles Spurgeon said, we're not saved by working, but by receiving. We're not saved by working, but by receiving. Not by what we give to God, but what God gives to us, and we receive from him. That's how we're saved, by what we receive from God. And God's word has the power to save you. We talked about that last week. God's word is powerful. Verse 22, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. See, you can't listen to God's word and just walk away. And forget about it. If you do that, you're fooling yourself. I'm never too impressed when somebody tells me, oh, you know so-and-so, he, he knows God's word. It's much more impressive to me someone who applies God's word. You've got to apply it into your life. Does you no good if you just know God's word? If you read this and say, I read this through every year. You know, you can read this through and just be moving the ribbons. But do you apply what God says? That's even more important. Listen, the devil knows the Bible. Don't look to see him in heaven. He's not going to be there. But he knows the book. He'll use it against us every chance he gets. Jesus said, anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. It's not just about hearing God's word, but obeying it. it tells us it's like looking in a mirror. James compares it to looking in a mirror. At the time the book of James was written, there was no glass. Glass hadn't been invented yet. So they would take brass and tin and polish it so they could see a reflection. If you were rich, you took silver and polished it, and you saw a reflection. So mirrors were smaller. It was something you held in your hand, something you held in your hand and you looked into. Getting, getting the idea? Something you held in your hand and looked into. <coughs> but James makes a comparison. It's like a man that looks in the mirror. Jim, it'd be like this. If I looked in the mirror and my hair wasn't right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? No, yeah. <laughs> and then I just walk away. Huh. You know, maybe I got food in my teeth and I see that and I've got that information. But now I just walk away. Well, that seems silly, doesn't it? He tells us it's just as foolish to look into God's word, get that information, see you need to make a change in your life and not do it. It's just as foolish to do that as a man that looks in the mirror, forgets what he looks like. We have to apply what God's word says and ask God to do a work in our heart. Bible commentator Adam Clark said, look carefully into God's word. To look carefully into God's word means to examine the state of your soul when you're reading God's word. Examine the state of your soul. We don't just glance at it. See, God's going to bless you if you carefully look into his word. If you're careful with it. If you treat it that way. If when you stop and read this book, you realize, 
God speaking to my heart. God speaking to my heart. I'm going to take this time to open this up and allow God to speak to my heart. He's got some important things to say. We have to look carefully into God's word. If we do that, he promises that God's going to bless us. And then he goes on in verse 26. He says, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself. And your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Wow, he says, if you claim to be religious, but you're not in control of your tongue, your religion's worthless. I love Bodhi Bachman. Bodhi Bachman says, if you don't say amen, at least say ouch. <laughs> because if you claim to be religious, and you're not in control of your tongue, it's like what we talked about earlier, be slow to speak. If you're not in control of what comes out of your mouth, your religion's worthless. I looked up that word religion in the New Testament, and every time it appears, almost every time it appears, it's negative. It's negative, that word religion. Because what James is really talking about here is having a devotion to God, but it's mainly external. It's mainly ceremonies. It's mainly following after stuff. Jesus said, what sorrow awaits you teachers and religious of the religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the smallest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. See, that's what the Pharisees were doing. They followed the rules. They followed the law. But it was an external thing. It wasn't living and active. And you've probably heard a lot of Christians say before, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. You have a relationship with Jesus. It's not this cold thing where we're just looking at a rule book. God speaks to us through his word, and we follow it. James uses the word religious here for someone who claims to be religious but can't control their mouth. So clearly they're not walking with God. Because a person who's truly walking with God has control over what comes out of their mouth. I'm not saying you're never going to slip up. But the mouth reveals what the heart's full of. Our tongues reveal what's going on in our heart. Jesus says, what you say flows from what's in your heart, Luke chapter 6. So don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself to say, I have this religion, but then I, I, I talk in a manner that's not controlled, that's not under control. He tells us that pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their time of distress, and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Pure and genuine religion. James says if you want pure and genuine religion, focus on two things. Focus on two things if you want to have pure and genuine religion. One, caring for widows and orphans in their time of distress. Acts of charity to needy people. And James mentions widows and orphans. If you think at the time, the New Testament times, women didn't work. Very rare for a woman to work. It was, a, it was a man's field. So if a woman was widowed, she was very vulnerable. She was very vulnerable. Orphans were vulnerable. There was no breadwinner. Acts of charity. We could add on to that for us, unwed mothers, homeless people, 
the elderly. These are all people that society has forgotten about that we should be caring for. We could add those things on there and say that's, that is pure and genuine religion to take care of them. Caring for them when they're in a time of distress. But James says that there were two parts to it. And the second part, don't re forget this because it's just impo as important, refusing to let the world corrupt you. Refusing to let the world corrupt you. That word refusing literally means watching guard. In verse 21, James told us to get rid of all filth and evil. And now he's telling us to watch guard. We talked about this last week, not to take sin lightly, not allow ourselves to be corrupted by this world, not to be corrupted by the world, being morally unstained, keep yourself spotless, unblemished, pure, undefiled. And listen, as Christians, we're not to recoil from the world. God's not asking us to recoil from the world. Not at all. He says we should be out there and we should be ministering to widows and orphans in their time of need. We're to go out there. We're to be in the world. We're not to recoil from it. The NIV says keeping yourself from being polluted by the world. So we go into the world. We work in the world. We go to school in the world, but we're not to allow the world to affect us. We don't start to take on their ideas. You know, a hundred years ago, I was thinking about this the other day, a hundred years ago, the things that go on in our society today would have been considered shameful. Wouldn't even have thought about it. Do you think God's changed in the last hundred years? Or have we changed as a society? Have we started to say, well, we'll say this is acceptable now, and well, yeah, let's add this in, and and gosh, I don't want to be judgmental. Let's add this in. Think God's changed? We go into the world, we work in the world, but we don't let the world corrupt us. That's just as important as taking care of widows and orphans. Don't let the world corrupt you. And I want to encourage you as a Christian to hold on to your beliefs. Don't start recoiling from your beliefs because the world has changed. I'm going to borrow something from Frank Turek. Um, you know, if you're at work or if you're at school, if you're somewhere, if your neighbor asks you about your beliefs, a really good question to open up with that is to ask them, do you consider yourself a tolerant person? Well, just almost anyone in the world is going to tell you, oh, yeah, I mean, that's the badge of honor in the world today. I'm tolerant. And then you can tell them, well, good, because now I know that you're going to be tolerant of my beliefs. That works for us, too. We don't need to constantly be recoiling from the world. They can be tolerant of our beliefs, just like they're asking us to be tolerant of them. And then we can speak the truth in love. Because, listen, I want to tell you something. The world, when they look at Jesus, they have it all wrong. They have it all wrong. They listen just a little bit. But they've got the whole idea wrong. We learned last week that there's no darkness in God. There's no darkness in God. So here's really how it is. You've got this God that's perfect. You've got this God that's perfect in heaven with no darkness in it. We have darkness in us. But God loved us so much... God loves this current world so much that he would not allow that to stand. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us so we could go to heaven. We've got a great message to take to the world. God loves you. He loves you so much, he came and died on a cross so you could spend eternity with him. We've got, when we're visiting the widows and the orphans and doing the things we're supposed to do, and keeping ourselves unpolluted by the world, we have this great, amazing message to share. God loves you. He loves you so much, he was willing to die for you, for you to have the opportunity to spend eternity with him. 
So, beloved, we don't go into the world with a message of hate. Don't let them tell you that. That's a lie of the devil, and it's become very popular to say, oh, Christians are hateful. We're not hateful. We go with the most positive, loving message. God loves you too much to leave you in the condition you're in. He loves you. He loves you. So listen, there's nothing loving about saying, I'm going to tolerate you where you're at and not, and not speak the truth to you in love. How is that tolerant? If the Pine Valley Bridge is out and I'm driving home, how tolerant is it? How, how loving would it be for you to say, I'm going to let Mark just drive over that bridge. I don't want to bother him with any of this kind of stuff. People in the world are headed for disaster. And God loved them so much that he gave his son so they can have everlasting life. He was willing to die. Beloved, that's a message of love. That's not a message of hate. So take out your, take out your bulletin and take out your notes. We learned in James chapter 1, verse 19, that you, we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. In verse 20, we learned that human anger does not promote righteousness. In verse 21, we learn to get rid of all filth, all evil that's going to change our clothes, change our spiritual clothes. Also in verse 21 and in Matthew 13, we learn to receive God's word in our hearts with a humble heart. In verse 22, and in Matthew chapter 7, we learn that we're supposed to be doers of God's word, not just hearers, not just someone that listens. We're to be doers of God's word. Verse 26, we learn that we're supposed to be in control of our tongue, allow the Holy Spirit to control us. Verse 27, we should take care of those in need. We should bring that message of love to those that are in need. And also, while we're doing that, not allow ourselves to be polluted by the world. Don't let the world rub off on you. Stick to what the Lord said. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, help us to be quick to hear, to be slow to speak, and to be even slower to become angry. Help us to get rid of anything in our lives that would keep us from having a good relationship with you, that would separate us from you. Help us to not just listen to your word, Lord, but apply it in our hearts. Lord, this week, give us opportunities to minister. Help us to find someone in distress this week, Lord, and minister to them. All the while, Lord, keeping us unpolluted by this world. We just ask for a hedge of protection around each person that's here this morning, Lord. And as we go back out, Lord, we just ask that you would protect each and every one of us, Lord. Lead us and guide us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.